Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father through Jesus Christ our Lord this Thursday morning. Uh, good morning, I'm Pastor Sheets, getting back into our Bible study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, we've completed two chapters in Proverbs, so today we start chapter 3. And uh, it's a blessing to be able to uh, do this for you as you listen, um, absorb, and take in the Word of God. And so, since this past Sunday was Transfiguration Sunday, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as uh, we pray, pray the collect prayer of the day from the Transfiguration of our Lord. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious Transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory, and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So again, this is chapter 3 of Proverbs, the wisdom book, the writings in the Bible portion. And I like chapter 3. It's uh, got some Bible passages a lot of people are familiar with, famous ones. Songs have been made over some of these verses. It's a very good chapter. 3 is a good number too, right? With the Lord, um, the Trinity, and the Trinity is spoken about in this chapter. And so let's start talking about Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Remember I said... Two, that you can break each verse down by half verses in these poetry um, writings here, just like the Psalms. And you can see how they come together, the verses. We're going to do that, some here. But Proverbs 3, verse 1. And verses 1 through 20 is the third address to a son. So note that this chapter has 35 verses. And the first 20 are addressed to a son. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. So teaching there goes with commandments. That is the commandments of the Lord. Um, those are brought up once again. Um, commandment talk I had from chapter 2. And what is this? Let your heart. Let your heart. Your mind, will, and emotions, right? The seat of your inner person. Let them, them keep the commandments. So your mind, will, and emotions always must look to God's commandments. And this chapter tells us why. So don't forget teaching. Um, the Torah, uh, the Ten Commandments, simply mean that. They mean teachings, good teachings. Um, so do not fret about this law talk. It is good law. It is how you are supposed to live, how the children of Israel were given just to live a good and peaceful life, as we will see that word in verse 2. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. The Hebrew word shalom, great, great word, a greeting for the Jewish people even today. And that word shalom is everything that provides wholeness, completeness, and satisfaction. And I want to turn back to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 22 when David was preparing Solomon to uh, build the temple there. Um, Solomon is, is charged to build the temple. And this peace, this completeness, it goes back to the Lord promising David, this son, who will do this in 22, verse 9. Talking to David, the Lord says, Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. Israel had peace and quietness in the reign of Solomon, and that's why they were able to build the temple and live in peace around that. It was a blessing. And so um, that, that peace is a, is a huge, huge deal. It is the ultimate goal uh, of our lives to have a, have a yearning to be joyful, 
But what is the definition of joy? Biblically speaking, it is to have peace. That is true joy. That is true comfort. That is what the Lord wants us to have. That's what the commandments are all about. If you uphold them, uh, you learn them, the teachings, you keep them in your heart, then you will have peace. That's a promise. It's a promise of God. You do not forget his teachings. You keep them in your mind, will, and emotions, and you will have peace. Peace they will add to you. Verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. What is them? Well, write them on the tablet of your heart. So the tablet, referring back to the two stones, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, um, bind them around your neck. That is a uh, external adoration there. And um, as God is, is speaking to a son, the Father's inspired words, is telling the son to internalize God's commands, the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord. And such internalization takes place from the Spirit through the Word of God. You see, God guides us. That's what the law is. It's a guide. It guides um, people to identify with Him, to act in accordance with His will. And always, always, the commands of the Lord are associated with His Word. His Word, but also the working of the Holy Spirit, because we need the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the words. So the, the Trinity is involved in wisdom, most definitely, and in the commandments. So write them on the tablet of your heart. So you internalize these. Verse 4, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Good success, ending of the first half of that verse, and God and man, the second, you see how they go together. Um, so this favor is an affectionate word. Um, it is a recognizable effect of the word. So you have this, people recognize you have the word with you. You wear the word in your heart. In your mind, will, and emotions. And verse 5, probably know this verse, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. That's a song I know, I think uh, Maranatha Singers, I think, made a song about that, verse 5 there. Um, but this trust, uh, huge, huge thing, right? Fear, love, and trust. Going back to the commandments, the meaning of the commandments, uh, the batak, in the Hebrew means to feel safe when a child feels safe in their parents abode and dwelling in arms they trust their parents and um, that is the action taking place to feel safe and it demonstrates the completeness the totality of God's guidance and his grace there that peace that the world cannot give you and the peace that surpasses all understanding and that's why that goes with that verse. Do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Acknowledge him, straight your paths, broken down in half verses. It's telling you, comparing, contrasting. Remember that end of the half verses, what they do, they interpret the verse for you. Acknowledgement. That is apply. Application. When you acknowledge the word, you say, I will apply it. I am going to apply it to my life. What do you apply? The teachings, the commandments. So that you may be well. So that you may have peace. Verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So you can see where Luther got this. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And all the explanation to the commandment meanings, we should fear and love God. So that, it's in the Proverbs right here. There's that fear of the Lord we talked about last time um, on Tuesday and the week before. There in verse 7. And so you go back and re-look at those. You can fast forward to the part about the fear of the Lord uh, and get that. And why? And it says, and turn away from evil. That's the 
same thing as repent, to do an about face and repent from evil. That means turn away from it, to put your back towards it. And you, you repent, you are fearing, loving, and trusting God. They go hand in hand. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Look at that. You want to have health and well-being in your physical body and not have to go to the doctor? There you go. Fear and love and trust in God above all things. Turn from evil and it will be a healing to your flesh. So you have an ailment here. You've got to turn inside and see what is going on there. Are you fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things? Are you turning? Are you repenting of something that you know you need to repent of? Maybe you don't even know that you need to repent of it. But this is a time to quiet yourself. Uh, get in a state of peace and read verse 7. And then, you know, the, the, the modernist or, you know, the New Age people tell you about the breathing. Take the deep breath. Ooh, ah, breathe in, breathe out. Well, that's just the breathing in of the Holy Spirit and breathing it out means to do it. It's going to give you complete well-being. That's a complete wholeness there in verse 8. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Wealth and first fruits go together there and that's important because Israel had a feast built around the feast of first fruits. And that's important again because Jesus rose on Easter morning on the feast of first fruits. He became them. So this wealth, do not assume that it's always monetary gain. Although we'll talk about that in verse 10 in, in coming. But the first fruits, this is Christological talk, um, that we honor the Lord. We do it with our, our wealth, with our offerings there. These, uh, these first fruits, uh, even children could understand the agricultural life of what it was doing for the people. Uh, and that made them well if their plants and their land and their crops did well. Uh, it's a language of sacrifice and it reflects the culture of God's people and their heritage. It was a big deal to bring the first fruits of your crops at the barley harvest to the priest and he would uh, bless them and you couldn't touch them uh, until those first fruits were brought to him and that meant that your land would produce a good harvest and do well and if your land did well, your family did well. So it all builds upon each other there. In verse 10, then your paths, well, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So your stuff does good. This filled and bursting language. Um, and so in prosperity talk, this is not a prosperity gospel, but generally speaking, generally speaking, those who live wisely before the Lord will prosper you know because you're you're doing what is good and wise and not being neglectful or my uh you know uh ways of evil is what ruins your money and your your thoughts your heart will mind will and emotions getting you to do dumb stuff um but it's it's just a natural outcome of faith and trust um, natural outcome of bringing your first fruits before the Lord that you will be, you know, doing good. You know, sometimes the Lord uh, seems like He gives us struggle at times. Uh, we need that actually in this world. Uh, the sinful world will suffer. But when you start understanding to hang these things around your heart and how you get complete well being, then there's a domino effect of positivity. That flows from these things. So, verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. So it's teaching. Um, don't despise the teaching. But also reproof means correction. Do not be weary of correction. Um, Solomon here is uh, instructing us what to do and what not to do. Um, and he's doing that in order so that we can learn how to live a God-pleasing life. This is instruction. But with instruction comes discipline. Just like a father, as it says. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Alright. <clears throat> so, him who he loves... Um, 
Don't forget, though, God's love is most evident in times of seer, uh, severe reproof. When we're actually getting severely reproved uh, and disciplined, that means the Father wants us to be healthy and whole, just as a, a human, an earthly parent uh, disciplines their children so that they do not get hurt in physical, and we need to look at it in the spiritual sense, too. Their whole mind, body, soul, will, emotions are fixed by the delight of the Lord, which involves reproof and discipline. And you can explain it to your children and those around you, too, why you are doing this. And uh, that in itself will teach them that it is a good thing. Um, God's love there. Um, what else here? I wanted to go back real quick, though, applying Old Testament to the New Testament. A shalom, a peace. Uh, the word in the Greek in the, in the New Testament is irene. Uh, Paul uses that as I did at the start of this. Uh, grace and peace be unto you. Uh, Charis, sukai, irene. That is what he's saying, grace and peace. And in the, in the New Testament, and that use there, that peace, it's, it doesn't mean just an absence of war, uh, but it does mean wholeness, well-being, unity, and salvation. So if you have peace, you are saved. You are saved from destruction. So it goes hand in hand. Christ makes the peace. And He is the one whom peace is ultimately found. Peace, that's shalom. That's the, the old Semitic away the greeting it also means and the Jews know this that when they say shalom may you be wholesome with God may you be found complete in God is what they and they believe that they're bestowing that upon somebody they're not just saying it hey peace what's up they're giving you a blessing because that's what the Lord gave them and it, it, it goes uh, with your, the others. It goes with the relationships of those around you. And uh, in believers, peace should be known and evident and present. Um, and it shows the kindness and grace of God. Peace, that's what it all is wrapped up in that one word. It's a Bible word. It's a pure word. It's a powerful word. So those first 12 verses then um, teaches us that God punishes those who stubbornly resist His mercy and refuse to follow His commands, but He promises abundant blessings to all who in faith receive His gracious love and salvation through the merits of Jesus Christ. There. So we got to understand that. And then breaks off into another segment in verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. So where can you be found and how do you get it? It only comes from God through His Word and where His Word is given. And that is like studies like this and through the church, of course, where you get it the most. We must be aware of that. Verse 14, For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. Jesus says in Matthew to you know, store your tr your treasures in heaven rather than on earth. So, wisdom is better than all earthly value. There's no amount of money. None of these quadrillionaire people that are in the news every day with their billions and billions and who can out top who. Uh, it doesn't matter. If they do not have the wisdom of the Lord, then they're like negative broke in comparison to the believer. And that's why Jesus encourages believers to store up your treasures, your wisdom. Uh, look to on high for that, and you are storing up treasures in heaven that are valuable for you for your whole life. And that's what it says in verse 16. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. So that's the, the balancing of being full. Um, you know, they're both carrying this, this goodness. <clears throat> All right, so this is 
going to get into wholeness talk, satisfaction talk here in verse 16. The long life and then 17. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. There's peace again, existing with peace, being content and satisfied. But what else? Remember, peace means being connected to God. So this is what it's teaching us, the blessings of the one who finds wisdom. Verse 18, she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold fast are called blessed. Lay hold of her, called blessed, and tree of life. First of four such references found here, uh, looking back, of course that word always goes to looking at the Garden of Eden and the tree of life, which Adam and Eve had to be banned from, lest they eat of it and live forever in sin. The Lord comes down, and He dies on the tree of life for us. And so now for believers, the tree of life signifies eternal salvation. And Jesus freely offers it. And we can partake of it now. Because he atoned for that. So tree of life, cross talk. Now verse 19, Trinity talk. The Lord by wisdom found in the earth. Remember in the beginning. And how? By understanding. He established the heavens. So wisdom and understanding. The Lord, there's the Father. And he did it by wisdom. Wisdom is always connected with the Word, the Son. And then what about understanding? We cannot understand these things without the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's the Trinitarian verse there in Proverbs 3.19. The Lord by wisdom and by understanding. They're all there. That's how he creates all things. Creates faith as well. How things are established. How peace is settled. And so we have an instrument in order to do this. We have the instrument through God, the Creator. And those Trinitarian uh, words, wisdom, word, understanding, all go together. Verse 20, by his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. So deeps and, and down the dew is water language. It is baptismal river talk. And by this knowledge, through baptism, you get the Holy Spirit, which gives you the wisdom and understanding and, and through the Word. So that's a baptismal verse there. Deep and do. Verse 21, My son, do not, let's, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Do not lose sight. So remember the path language there. And... The rest of the chapter here is dealing with relationship with others. Um, commandments, once again, right? The first three are about God and that vertical relationship, and then the, the last seven are horizontal with our neighbor. It's what these last things do. Uh, teach us about human relationships, and then the evidence of being able to be seen from what flows inward goes outward to the left and to the right here. So, keep sound wisdom and discretion. Verse 22, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. So that's, remember, it talked about wearing them around your neck. This uh, adorning uh, language here. And that is, once again, inwardly received and outwardly evidenced. Inwardly received and outwardly evidenced. 23, then you will walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. And there's the path language again. It doesn't put rocks in the road. Uh, you look at him and the ground is, is clear. You don't need to put your head down. Uh, we do that a lot as just common things. It's not a sin to put your head down when you walk. It's just common. We're looking for where we're going. Um, our sidewalks and streets, you know, are not perfect. And they're an example if you ever go on a walk down your street. You probably don't have a perfect uh, sidewalk. Uh, through your neighborhood unless it's a brand new community but I'm saying this uh, talk because like I say in everyday life you can see the bumps on the on the road the uneven uh, pavement of life and then while you're on your walk you can think about Proverbs you can think about wisdom and how it's like that you need to you need to uh, watch where you're going but this is teaching us if you're looking at Christ alone that you do not have to look down 
I think uh, the Marines in the, in the military, one of the things they teach is that you don't look down. You know, you're proud and you look your head, and you're, uh, you look straight ahead. The Coast Guard that I was in, they called it keep your eyes in the boat. Um, two, they, they don't want you putting your head down, but eyes in the boat means straight ahead. When you stand at attention, they say eyes in the boat. And that means uh, look straight ahead. I don't know what the terms is in the other services, but I know they're the same way. And you will not stumble. And what is this good for? Just that one time? No. Nope. Verse 24, if you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. So this is all day, all day and night. Uh, even when you're asleep and you don't know what's going on around you, you will not be afraid, but you have that fear, love, and trust in God when you go to bed at night. That's what's going on there. And 25 and 26 go together. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Those two verses go together. And confidence is another um, believer word. It's what grace and peace bestows is, is confidentness to the righteous. And we have that, but it's rooted and originally founded in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is how you don't miss a step. It's God-given confidence. And we need to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. See what Paul says about this. You can look back on Proverbs here too, when you're reading the New Testament. And he says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. So, the reckoning, the considering, the fitness, the enabling, the God-given confidence is sure and sufficient in these things. Why? Because we fear and love and trust in God. And He will be your confidence. So we should not look at it as I'm confident. And so, ha, 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 I've learned how to be confident. No, you should say, I have confidence and I got it from the Lord. So I have Him. If you have confidence and you are confident, then you have the Lord. Look at it that way. And that keeps your foot from being caught. Verse 27, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. Here's the neighbor talk now. Uh, to whom those who are in need. Um, provide help. And verse 28, do not say to your neighbor, see there it is, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. No, uh, back up there we use this language a lot. Um, to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do so. We, we do that to our friends and, and family and neighbors. Uh, co-workers and that. They ask something. They need your help. And you say, well, I'll do everything in my power to make sure that you can do it. You know, I, don't, I can't promise you anything, but I'll do everything in my power. Uh, that's, that phrase is used a lot in our culture. And so this is biblical talk. When you do have that power, uh, the Lord gives you different positions in life, then use it when somebody is in need. Don't tell them to wait and come back tomorrow. Uh, you bring me something first? No. And um, then we move from there to do it when uh, you can. Then 29, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. So see, you can look at that as literally your neighbors are the houses to your left and right, but that's not what neighbor means in the commandments of the Lord. Um, it is to all mankind, everybody you come in contact with, everybody that lives in the same town you do, it does, uh, goes to the same places you do, are your neighbor. So don't plan evil against them who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done no harm to you. So notice there it says for no reason. So that means you may have to contend with man for a reason um, when contention is necessary. But dwells trustingly beside you. 
31. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. So think on that for a minute here. I need to get up for a minute. Come right back. Busy times, busy days here. We're almost done. I've got to get through this. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. And do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. It's verse 31. That's this obvious. Um, don't envy, you know, whatever they're gaining, you think they're gaining from it. Uh, they're really not. That goes back to the other two chapters. Verse 32, for the devious person is an abomination, wow, to the Lord. But the upright are in his confidence. Remember, that goes back to verses 25 and 26, for the Lord will be your confidence. But for the devious person, they're using a word, abomination. Abomination is not a good word. And it goes all the way to the end of the book, the abomination of desolation. And what does that have to do with? The most abominating thing there ever could be, and this is the definition of the unpardonable, unforgivable sin, the only one that can't be, and that is of the unrepentant sinner. That's an abomination. Um, and those who reject God's gift of salvation is an abomination, and they will receive everlasting torment from it. It cannot be forgiven if they reject salvation. It is an abomination. That's the definition of that. Uh, but this confidence brings us close to Christ and makes us his friends there. And so we go on to what's going to happen with abominable people. 33, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. So the contrast uh, themes are coming in here, the this or that. But the Lord's curse here, that, that is punishment and torment, folks. Um, and yes, ultimately eternal damnation. And that is because it is an abomination to be unrepentant of heart and to reject God's salvation. Now, this is justice talk. It's just telling us that the Lord will deal with it. And he will deal with it um, rightly and uh, equitably. And last two verses now. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. And that's quoted in James um, chapter 4 and 1 Peter 5, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humility needs to take place here. We're getting all this good knowledge. And once you uh, get all this goodness and peace and wholeness upon you, you might become man-confident which means egotistical, and you might say, I have this and I have this and why don't you? No, it's not about that, but this favor is what all this is about. Chapter 3, uh, he gives to you in humility. Um, it will be outwardly evident, but you don't need to go uh, saying, look at me, look at me. You, don't, you shouldn't have to say that. It should just be automatically outwardly evident, and people actually come to you, well, what's what has gotten into you? You're, you're bright and, and cheery and peaceful. Uh, tell me about it. You don't even have to tell them. And that's what, but to the humble he gives favor. And then the last verse, we got through a whole chapter again. These, ver these chapters are long. So I don't know how many minutes this has been on, but glad you're bearing with me. And the last verse, the wise will inherit honor. Here's a promise. But fools get disgrace. So there's a promise both to the wise and both to the fools. And uh, it is ultimately the wise uh, who get rejected by the scoffers. Uh, they, don't, they don't like the wise. Uh, the evil doesn't like the confidence of God, how you get it. Um, but those who are God's children inherit. This is inheritance talk. The inheritance of being a child of God, going all the way now, remember I taught you to read backwards, uh, go back in those in um, half verses all the way through that chapter later today. And you can see how this is a great inheritance as a, being received 
as being a children, uh, a child of God. Instead of the eternal punishment and disgrace, you get God's grace. So wrapping it all up, um, Solomon, who was a parent, a teacher, he's emphasizing the blessings of God that he gives through wisdom, that he imparts those things, their blessings. And those blessings include treasures of what? What are the treasures of the Lord? Peace, security, confidence. And it is a portion to those who trust in the Lord. Trust in Him for what? For forgiveness, for new life and eternal salvation. And the blessings of those possessing that true wisdom are contrasted with the condemnation accorded to those who resist and scorn God's favor. So that's the whole wrap-up of chapter 3. And uh, we pray to the triune God, the three and one and one and three, that, dear Lord, make us humble. Make us humble before you so that we may receive and ever hold fast the treasures of your grace. Enable us to live according to the wisdom that comes only from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Be blessed.